information. I made a mistake. <laughs> My original sin. <laughs> We often don't take the time to be present to ourselves and our lives. This morning's meditation, a poem by Mary Oliver, takes us on a journey of returning to that presence of self. Join me, if you will. Take a moment to center yourself. Feel yourself supported by your chair and the ground beneath your feet. Notice your breath as it moves in and out of your body. Feel your body relax as you continue to inhale and exhale naturally. The Journey by Mary Oliver. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began. Though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. Though the whole house began to tremble. And you felt that old tug at your ankles. Men, my life, each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundation, though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough and a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds. And there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. Thank you for your presence here today. Well, that's a nice introduction to our speaker, David Crest, who's talking about healing from the inside out. Healing from the inside out allows us to actively participate in our own healing, thus allowing for us to draw on unknown and often unacknowledged resources to live life more fully. David Crest holds a degree in holistic medicine, has studied at the Cushy Institute of Oriental Medicine, opened a clinic in Denver, and hosted a radio program, Health Alternatives. He lived with indigenous people in the Himalayas and experienced healing using plants and food. Over a 30-year span, he lived in with people healing from disease and illness and with those who were dying of cancer, AIDS, and other maladies. Let us hear the wisdom of David Crest this morning. Thank you, Margaret. Oh, it's just such a pleasure to be here. I, I'm really grateful that you showed up. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm happy I showed up. Uh, so, um, well, I, I, I wanted to give thanks to uh, Carmen and Isabel, who, who uh, work back there, and they're kind of like just back there. And then um, 
of course, Sergio, who's pretty much heading the whole thing this morning, and uh, Rambling Roy, who's doing the video. Hi, Mom! <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so let's see, I guess that's it there. And Mar Margaret, of course. Thank you, dear Margaret. And Jacqueline, mi amor. If it weren't for Jackie, I'd be, uh, probably wouldn't be up here because I, I ramble. You know, that, that's why this, this is, uh, you know, I'm, this is my life experience on paper. And um, I, I, if, if I did it just on my own without reading it, I'd be, you know, <laughs> over here in the flowers or whatever. So uh, with, with Jackie, she just really centered me and would draw out, uh, I mean, 10 minutes with her and I'm exhausted. <laughs> you know, really, I mean, oh, my brain is whoa. But anyway, here it is. So, uh, I was raised in the mountains of Colorado in the 1940s with a uh, few man-made distractions. And my relationship with uh, uh, my environment spurred my awe and curiosity as I communicated daily with my fellow beings of the natural world. Um, they were really, I mean, here I am pretty much alone, you know, and, and with, with nature. So anyway, during puberty, I began to look at events in my life that didn't make sense to me. Um, news would come from family in New York as aunts and uncles were dying of diabetes and cancer, etc., heart attack. And our good uh, mountain neighbor friend, Dr. Frank, was painfully dying of cancer. And these these events brought forth in my mind, when we are old, do we have to suffer before we die? At age 12, I was hit by a car, which resulted in a compound fracture, which led to a long, drawn-out, and painful experience of suffering. Ambulances, doctors, nurses, needles, traction, ether, suffering, anxiety, and being bedridden for nine months. Um, after which, at last, I was again in my beloved meadow, deeply contemplating the questions. Is suffering necessary? And if so, why? What good could it possibly bring? My mind and soul were longing for clarity. While in this state of supersensitivity, a vision came to me. Standing close and facing me is a white-haired, bearded man next to a group of pine trees, dressed, dressed in a white robe. Kind of get that image of God back then, you know, of what he or you know, he at that time looked like. His left arm, hand open, is stretched out toward a clothed man lying on the earth, supported by grasses and buttercups. The message, although unspoken, was that the natural world heals its own, mentally, physically, and emotionally. These early in life experiences led me to obtain a degree in holistic medicine and study at the Kushi Institute of Oriental Medicine so that I could use professionally what I knew to be true. <coughs> In 1980, I opened the Colorado Health Clinic in Denver, Colorado, along with hosting a radio program, Health Alternatives. My practice eventually led me to live in with individuals, one at a time. People who were wanting to heal from disease and illness, and those who were dying of cancer, AIDS, and other maladies. I discovered that while participating in the healing of others, I am healing myself. And that the healing process is ongoing all of our life. And we have to be in the process. Which brings us to Phyllis. Phyllis was in her mid to late 50s in Hollywood Hills, living in a well-built home in the 40s era with plenty of art and furnishings, 
tucked into the side of the mountain above Hollywood. Hollywood. I was led by a maid to the lower level, past the bedroom where her father, a once successful Buick dealer, had died a few months earlier. At the end of the hallway was Phyllis's room. Her room, in spite of the window, was bleak, stagnant, and smelled heavily of old urine. Phyllis was lying in bed where she had spent most of her time for five years uh, since her stroke. She greeted me with a warm, half-faced smile and words, I've been waiting for you, David, like she had known me forever. We both knew, she more than I, that we would spend quality time together. The first thing we did in transforming Phyllis's physical world environment was to get her tucked into a freshly linen bed I set up in the living room upstairs to give her a new view from which to begin her new life and healing process. The next move, after tea and toasted sourdough cinnamon bread, was for me to go down and clean the bread bedroom while Phyllis napped. I ripped up the carpet and tossed it out the window and scrubbed the wooden floor. Over the next couple of months, we enjoyed each other's company, sharing delicious, nutritious food that I had prepared with her taste buds in mind and beautifully presented on her fine china and in the orderly, chemical-free cleanliness of bright and alive space of our home. Deeply hidden stories and history was revealed. And I listened. We had only been, been together a few weeks when Phyllis stopped calling her ex-gardener, asking him to bring her her regular supply of burden, bourbon. By the eighth week, Phyllis was in her garden, in a wheelchair, directing her once estranged son, Alan, and me in reviving the unkempt plants, flowers, bushes, and walkways asking to be weeded. For days, she took pleasure in bringing the garden and her relationship with her son back to life. One day, a week or so later, Phyllis came out of her room dressed to the hilt in her furs, red lipstick, bangles, and beads, and asked me to chauffeur her in the uh, in her Buick Riviera. Remember, father was a Buick. We drove to her country club and lunched with actor Tom Selleck. Remember Tom Selleck? Uh, on the day I left, Phyllis, Phyllis gifted me the Buick Riviera and a full tuition to the Cushy Institute of Oriental Medicine. I drove away, taking with me the realization that in our aging, we do not have to carry the burden of accumulated sorrows, physical and psychological pain, and that suffering can be relieved. What I see is that Phyllis had to call the healing into her life. She was sick of being sick. Living in 24-7 with those who want to heal has dramatic, as you can imagine, results and many advantages. Quite quickly, we get, get the small stuff out of the way, and there is a shared commitment for transformation or change. Out of this committed relationship and the intimate process of getting to know one another, a deep trust of oneself and each other develops. I learned more about the importance of trust and honesty from John, who was in his early 50s, 
a psychologist turned clown, known and loved by children and adults alike. As Mr. Baloney, he quickly and delightfully before our eyes transformed flat, long, colorful strings into active, light-hearted creatures who captivated each child in the audience. We delighted in the magic brought forth through Mr. Baloney. The man with the soft smile, sparkling eyes, nimble fingers, and an endless source of breath. John lived in a light, spacious home in Atlantic Beach, Florida, where he and his friends, and he and we, his friends, practiced weekly yoga. The yoga gathering ended for no known reason. Months later, I received word that John was living elsewhere and was ill. I called on John in the small, dark, one-room apartment he had moved into and found him looking like his living space, dark and drab, on dialysis because of kidney failure. We openly talked and agreed that he would come live with me and we would care for his kidneys. I created a room that was bright, furnished, with a single futon on a polished wooden pine floor, a potted geranium and asparagus plant, a bamboo shaded floor lamp, and a glass door leading to our lily pond, which housed many creatures, including singing frogs. John's diet was basically macrobiotic, designed to revive his kidneys. Believing that food and touch are essential to the healing process, I massaged John using sesame oil and hot ginger poultices daily, along with moxibustion applications. He would drive himself to dialysis treatment two times a week. Um, after three weeks of our healing interaction, he needed dialysis one time per week. A few days later, John shared with me that the nurses greeted him, saying he no longer required treatment, that his kidneys were functioning. John moved on, revived Mr. Baloney, and hit the road with a female fellow clown. Several months later, I heard that John's kidneys had failed him and he died. Now I see that neither John nor I had, were fully engaged in his healing, partially due to previously unresolved issues between us. His symptoms disappeared, but the cause remained. I am reminded that symptoms are the first to be relieved, whether it be through drugs, surgery, diet, herbs, psychotherapy, prayer. Symptoms can be eliminated and called a cure by allopathic medicine. That's their defi the definition by allopathic medicine is uh, it's, it's called a cure. It is, it is necessary that the underlying cause be addressed in order to bring forth the true healing. I believe healing calls for one to look within for the cause. Emotions, lifestyle, thoughts, all have to be explored. Which brings us to Georgia. Georgia called me after I had moved from Denver to Boulder and was meeting with patients in their homes or outside in nature. We met in a self-development seminar and I knew that she had suffered from a severely low self-image and lacked any motivation to do anything about it, leaving her confused and disheartened. Georgia was in her mid-twenties legally blind, and wore eyeglasses, 
lens is as thick as the bottom of a, remember the old Coke bottle? She dressed in drab clothing with no adornments, like she didn't want to be seen. We agreed to meet up Boulder Creek Canyon on a sunny, crisp autumn day and sat by, side by side on a boulder next to the next to the rushing white water, which was carrying colorful aspen leaves from up canyon. We sat quietly, absorbed by the beauty and tranquility in the safety of nature. Georgia began talking about her life. I listened. Like the white water, her emotions flowed out enabling her to see what had led her to respond to life with a distorted self-image and feeling powerless. Time passed without us keeping it. Without words, we rose and walked back into the world. Georgia left her glasses behind. There was no discussion or attention brought to the fact. Two days later, Georgia called, informing me she had clear vision, no longer needing eyeglasses. Later, I happened to see her on the street, dressed attractively and walking with assurance. Georgia became like the clear and beautiful environment she brought from the canyon. I now see more clearly that my presence was all she needed, offering no solution, just listening. Georgia is a clear example of healing from the inside out because she was ready to explore her inner emotional psychological condition, her visible outer condition. A poor eyesight was corrected. Her outer appearance changed because of her inner work. Sir Harold. Harold, an 86-year-old retired first chair bassoonist with the New York Philharmonic under the direction of Leonard Bernstein, and professor at the Juilliard School of Music in New York City. Classical music was the only music, according to Sir to Harold, quote, quoting Harold, anything other than classical music is shit. <laughs> Harold was dying of cancer, prostate cancer. He wanted to die at home. After our honeymoon period, when we had exhausted the small talk, Harold became comfortable enough in our relationship to show his arrogance, his rigidness, his inability to own his own weaknesses, and his dislike for me. <laughs> Harold became Sir Harold, as he was now committed to take charge of his own life. His physical state was that of being overweight, low energy, said and Terry. I have a problem with that word, I can't <laughs> sedentary, taking drugs for pain, and immobile. He was consuming an average of 15 different medications, including meds for depression, constipation, and diarrhea. <laughs> which was typical for most of my, my uh, past, previous, and future patients. It was typical. And Sir Harold was on oxygen. His daily diet, other than his medications, consisted of, for the most part, processed foods, frozen, packaged, and prepared, and his daily dose of Tums for the tummy, which he ate like candy, televised news, and other forms of entertainment to distract him from his suffering. 
Sir Harold was basically homebound, voluntarily so. When I brought up the fact that his attitude and lack of social interaction were standing in the way of his enjoyment of his final days, he would find it intimidating and would simply dismiss me. As I continued to challenge him in a lighthearted way and at times being a prick, <laughs> simply because I too would become intimidated, Sir Harold began to admit it was true. And without apology, he would still ignore the fact of his private suffering. He held on to his yet unchallenged by him belief that all was well. I was constantly challenging him. But the inevitable change was happening. <laughs> With our delicious macrobiotic meals, prepared, presented, and, pres uh, and served by moi, the appealing and tasty food drew Sir Harold's gastronomical attention. <laughs> Rhythm and rest, which had been so much a part of Sir Harold's musical career, played an important part in our daily life together. Sunday was Sir Harold's favorite day as we enjoyed chicken and dumplings, the New York Times. Then we would drive up to beautiful Glenwood, up beautiful Glenwood uh, Canyon to Aspen, where his beloved New York Philharmonic was performing on a, every, every Sunday in the spring, summer. Keep the patient amused while nature works its cure. Worked well for both of us. Eventually, over a period of time, Sir Harold weaned himself of all medication. And finally, his bottled oxygen. Eventually, over a period of time, well, I already read that. Giving up dependency on medications was most difficult challenge and took trust. Trust in himself and trust in me, the carer. Sir Harold phoned the oxygen supplier and requested that they come pick up the oxygen tanks. When the man arrived, he told us that this was the first time he retrieved oxygen tanks from a living person. <laughs> the three of us got a good, healthy belly laugh. All this we did with well-meaning manipulation, love, downright meanness, and great respect, bringing Sir Harold to the point of being free of pain, addiction, and muddled thinking. Sir Harold's resistant, negative attitude subsided and was, for the most part, replaced with a more open view of himself, others, and me, his friend. One day we were luxurating in the ancient thermal waters of Glenwood Springs when Sir Harold came to the point of acknowledging his grandson, a blues musician. Remember his idea? <laughs> who had dedicated his first album to his grandfather, who had inspired his love of music. That album sat on the bottom shelf of his library, unopened. Let's see, where am I? Oh, two years later. Sir Harold had not looked at it, nor read the inscription or listened to his grandson's son's music. Pride and arrogance now gone, Sir Harold opened the way to a full relationship with his grandson. We had accomplished what we'd come together to do. It was time. Sir Harold gave me a warm adios hug with his drug-free, slim, healthy body, and I left for the Himalaya Mountains. 
This body informs me of the quality of health it, thus I, am experiencing. Aches, flexibility, energy level, vision, urine and bowel quality, state of mind, skin coloration, all of these messages which led me, lead me to know how I'm doing and feeling. The exterior of this body, when I take the time to notice, shows me what's happening on the other side of my skin, inside. Our relationship with the food we eat may actually be our most intimate relationship with the outside world. We take in food, which becomes our body, daily. We become what we eat, not only the thoughts we think, but our physical food also. Back to script. Yeah, didn't go on. <laughs> uh, what we eat plays an obvious part in our overall health. What we eat, how and when we eat, what we think about our food and not, play an important role in our physical and mental health. This is why I put such great importance on the food I prepared and served to the people who were wanting to heal themselves. Our individual lives are as unique as they are the same. No disease has the same cause. No symptoms are identical. There are many, many roads to help. It is for us the individual to discover the way on our own with the help, guidance, and commitment of our chosen helpers. As we heard in my stories, it is essential that the commitment to heal oneself is present. The willingness to explore the underlying cause, being attitude, emotions, thought patterns, thoughts, patterns of reactions and response, and lifestyle. As we clearly saw, Phyllis was sick of being sick and was committed to change. When placed in a beautiful, clean, chemical-free healing environment that supported her commitment, Phyllis came back into life. Georgia in a safe and natural environment of beauty, was able to explore past, buried emotions that she had not wanted to see, thus bringing herself and her vision into clarity. John, Mr. Balloony, wanted to get off dialysis, which was painfully consuming his energy and his life. I offered him that possibility. What worked for the short duration was the strict and healthy diet, along with a bright, airy, and quiet space which supported the cure for his physical body, his kidneys. What did not work was that we did not establish a trusting relationship that would have enabled us to investigate together the deeper cause. Initially, Sir Harold wanted a nurse maid to do his bidding, make, his com make him comfortable and happy, but he got me. <laughs> and together we were able to move through our significant differences. This stagnation of Sir Harold being comfortably depressed and my determination to do or die, we stuck with it. And in doing so, our trust, respect, and enjoyment of each other grew. Out of this relationship, healing took place. If I were to participate in another's healing now, I would take advantage of the many healing arts available today, including art itself. 
Music, dance, drama, poetry, singing, painting, expressive collage, all of which are recognized today by most healing professions to produce significant physical and emotional development or benefits. I would bring in, in a broader support system to enhance the quality of the healing process. For myself, I would consider my personal health and clarity as the first priority in being with another in her his transformation. What I have learned and added to my repertoire is that the outer reflects the inner of us, and that in order to maintain a balance to where they move as one, we must be aware of the dance between the two. Lightness, humor, enjoyment of our work, pleasure from our food, and acceptance of ourselves, thus others, are all medicines in the true sense. Rule, rules are as elusive as time and space. A great example of healing from inside out can be seen on TED Talks titled, My Father Locked in His Body But Soaring Free. Thank you for your attention and your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for that wonderful, wonderful talk. And I know you since quite a while, and we hiked a little bit, and I really know that you did what you talk about. And you found so wonderful words for what you want to express. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks for the know on it. It's just a short question. I like that you come back and talk more about when you live in the Himalaya. Oh, yeah. I get a bit more about that. Yeah, great, okay. great story. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I, I keep not being able to pronounce your name. So tell me again. Yes, I guess nobody would be able to. Well, but I will. Gaitan. 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 Thank you, Gaitan. Tell me about Cushy University. What did it do for you and you still have the Buick? <laughs> <laughs> no, I gave the Buick to my uh, my uh, used to be wife. <laughs> Actually it was and, and it was on my way to the Cushy Institute. I dropped it off and then took a, tra a freight train part of the way. But what, what was the other uh, oh what what the Cushy Institute was about? Oh, it's in Boston. Uh, yeah, it's it's quite. Uh, it, it was really a wonderful experience. Uh, you know, I I had been uh, practicing. Uh, I'll, I'll say, you know, Oriental. Macro I mean, if, if you're all, for, you you probably heard the word macrobiotic. The meaning is, I think, much different than most of us may think. Most of us think it's a diet. Well, it is, but it's also what I talked about here, you know, it's deep, you know, and, uh, 
includes chicken and dumplings, where one would think, wait a minute, you know? So it's much broader, and uh, that's all I can say about that. It, great place. It, it's still still going strongly. Anyone else? Yes. How does one begin with the process of eliminating what you think might be causing some malady that you have? I think just that, uh -huh. you know, you uh, deciding it's time to look. And, you know, because when, when we look, all of a sudden it, uh, things become very apparent. And, um, you know, I'll speak for myself personally, and, and with my patients, but myself personally, that uh, when I, uh, you know, say, for instance, find something, uh, uh, say, when I, when I meditate, you know, and, and find something uh, that's bothering me, rather than push it aside or justify it, or it's like, really, really look at it. Because, uh, you know, my outward expression, if I'm holding a judgment of another person as being an asshole, it's like, mm -hmm. I'm suffering. I'm, it, there's no doubt about it. Even though I can say, I'm not suffering. He is an asshole. You know. <laughs> so there, there, there's that. And, and that it is, like I said, it's an on, ongoing process. I, I think, I believe, up until and beyond when we actually leave our body. And that it's, you know, being with, uh, you know, people in the dying process, I found it to be, you know, I, I'd have to say, really true that uh, going out clean is, is real important. And, and that being here clean is really important. So in a sense, preparing ourselves right now. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for setting your clocks back and coming on time. And we'll see you next week, Day of the Dead. So dispose properly of your trash and uh, turn your cell phones on if you must. Hi, Sheila. Hi. 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 Hi